Yeah, just hey, I think we're live. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Your Lake Fort Guide. And a little different scene for our seminar this week. This is our seminar that we do every two weeks, typically. Uh, we're normally at Lake Fort Marina, but there's something going on at Lake Fort Marina this week. There's a little bit of a tournament going on. Small. Just a small one. So this is going to be our Lake Fort Bass Fishing Seminar. And tonight, we're going to give you guys tournament tips to help you catch monster money winning bass. And we've got some stories behind some giant bass that have been caught the last couple weeks. We're going to tell you guys all the details of who, what, when, where, how. Uh, and then go in depth on some of the techniques that have been working to catch these big bass at Lake Fork. And I got my man Cody Mays. He's here by my side. This cat right here is like tournament fishing guru out there with that slot. Lake Fork, tournaments at Lake Fork are a little different because we have a special slot limit. You can only keep fish under 16 inches or over 24 inches uh, and only one over 24 um, but in, in a big bass tournament, it's only one at a time anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But anyway, you can all, keeper fish have to be under 16 or over 24. So if you're watching this, you're not from Lake Fork, you wonder why we're talking about how to catch a little two pounder, two and a half pounders. It's because they win money because you can't keep anything between 16 and 24 inches. So Cody has a knack for that, man. He is he's a great fisherman, catches a lot of fish regardless of the size. But uh, before he started guiding, when he tournament fished, he did a phenomenal job of catching those money winning fish and winning a lot of uh, cash and prizes in that process. So I wanted him to come do this with me tonight because this is one of the biggest tournaments of the year, Cody. This is the Skeeter Owners Tournament. Um, it is, there's a handful of tournaments a year. You've got Mega Bass, Skeeter Owners, Sealy, Outdoors, Big Bass Splash, and Berkeley. And Legends. Yeah, and I don't think Legends is quite as big as those other four. I don't know. Do you know? Is it? It's not. No, it's not nowhere near as big. But it's same same it's payout. Same thing. type of pay yeah. and same type of format. Big bass. Mm -hmm. So we have the five big bass events throughout the year, and that's the five. And so this is one of them, and it it's one of the bigger ones out of that group. Really, I think after Sealy Outdoors, I think this is either this or Mega Bass is the biggest event. Yeah. I've always, I've never got to fish a Skeeter uh, because I've never owned a Skeeter. Yeah, but it's an owner's tournament, so you either got to own a Skeeter or fish with somebody that owns a Skeeter. I always wanted to, but I, my my thing is I always want to go find the ducks. I didn't care about the fishing in there. I just want to go find the. So ducks. tell us about <laughs> the ducks, because people may not know about the ducks. All right, so they give out they they go out and they put out these ducks on the lake, and um, if you find one, you take it up to weigh in and you get a prize and. From what I understand, a lot of the prizes, you know, my brother-in-law won one. He won a, a, a Helix 12 yeah. on one of the ducks. Oh, they give away some thousands of dollars of prizes. Power poles, yeah. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So if you it's find wild. a duck, it's not some kid's duck that just got thrown out in the lake. No, pick it up. <laughs> it's not It's not Betty Sue and Bobby Ray's rubber ducky. It's got a prize attached to it. Get that sucker in a boat, man. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. They do put on a great event. Also, one thing I know about Skid Owners Tournament, you sign up, the entry fee is like 150 bucks or 120 bucks, whatever it is. It's like you pay $120 and they hand you $180 worth of stuff. Yeah. Like you get a rod, you get a grab bag full of gear. It's like $180, $200 or maybe more worth of swag gear that they give you. Like you make money as soon as you pay your entry fee, basically. Yeah, and they're even doing Costa sunglasses this year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's hundreds. So you're more than doubling your money now. Yeah. And they're bringing, they, they didn't do it last year, I believe, but they're doing it this year. They're having a big barbecue. And from what I understand, that barbecue, whoever cooks it, is phenomenal. So. Well, they used to be Tony Shachery, man. Like the like Tony's, like Tony Shachery's mm -hmm. season. Like he used to be, I, I don't know about the public, but like there used to be, like if you were on the pro staff or whatever, you went to the, the Skeeter Owners Tournament staff dinner. Tony Shachery would actually cook ribeye steaks for you. Oh, wow. The actual guy. From the seasoning company that owns it, so uh, I don't know if he's the one doing the barbecue or not. I have no idea, but maybe, maybe, maybe who knows? Apparently, he likes the bass fish and he likes skeeter boats. So, man, we appreciate you guys joining us as always. Do us a favor, go ahead and hit that thumbs up and, and uh, drop us some comments so we know who we're talking to. Share this thing, get it out to more people. Uh, our whole our whole goal is to help more people catch more and bigger fish in this whole situation that we're doing. Man, I'm stumbling on my words now. <laughs> It's just, just killing the game, dog. Just killing it. But, um, yes, we want to help people catch more and bigger fish, as many people as we can. And we do specifically want to help you guys that are here for Owner's Tournament. That's what this live stream is all about tonight. That's what the seminar is all about tonight. But on top of that, there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about tonight that you guys that don't fish Lake Fork or aren't at this event, 
you'll be able to learn things to catch fish on your home bodies of water as well with the topics that we talk about tonight. So it is summer. It is, you know, post-spawn is definitely, I mean, we're almost, to me, leaving post-spawn and going into summer patterns. It's kind of what it feels like to me. And the fish are offshore. Lake Forks, five and a half foot low still, maybe even a little more than that now. because 5.61. 5.61. So we're starting to get more and more um, evaporation on a day-to-day -day basis. we got 100 degree temperatures this week. It's going to start creating. So Lake Fork is low, and it's going to continue to, based on history, and all practical thinking would tell you, Lake Fork will continue to drop from here. That's going to pull more fish even further out of the creeks, more fish even further off the bank away from the pockets, and position more and more fish day after day, week after week, month after month throughout the summer in these offshore main lake structures. And really, we talked about this a couple weeks ago at the seminar a little bit. This lake, the key to this lake is turned into these hard spots, man. Uh, they're commonly referred to as shell beds. Some of them are shell. You know, you, there's some shell on them. Some of them are rock. Um, it's just a mix. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't have to be either or. It, it just needs to be a hard spot. These hard spots are what drives this lake right now. It's where these fish come to feed. And, and the reason that it is where they come to feed is because what does it take to create these hard spots? Why is this piece of ground hard on the lake bottom and this piece of ground not as hard? Well, if you think about that from a from redneck science, you know what I mean, perspective, <laughs> What makes that ground hard under the water is current. Wind current primarily on Lake Fork. We don't really have any current generation on Lake Fork. It's wind current for the most. 99.9% .9 of the current on Lake Fork is wind current. So wherever the wind blows this water, and when you think when you've got the water coming all the way from the dam all the way up to 2946 over Heartbreak Ridge out there, you know what I mean? Like there's a reason so much of Heartbreak Ridge just feels so hard because it gets all the water from the dam, pushes all the way up the lake and washes over it on that south side of Heartbreak Ridge. Well, that is what creates those hard spots is all the soft bottom is washed away, is washed off by that wind current, by that water pushing over it over the years. Um, and it creates these harder bottom places. So anywhere that you have a hard spot is where the water gets condensed, gets pressured over a rise, whether it's a point, a hump, a pond, and whatever it may be, it's where the water pressure comes over the top of it, right? Sorry about that. I checked phone real quick. <laughs> Getting some things. Um, what also comes with that? What else comes with that? When you have wind pushing up the lake, what else comes with that, Maze? Well, you got bait fish on those hard bait. On those what hard makes bait the bait fish. fish show up there? The wind and the hardness. Plankton. Or plankton, yeah. Plankton. So whatever wherever the wind rushes over a point of hump or whatever or just pushes into a corner sometimes wherever it's made that hard spot that means that's where the water pressure got condensed the greatest that's also where the plankton in 50 foot of water now it's in 10 foot of water the plankton gets condensed the plankton plankton gets the thickest what a bait fish feed on plankton so wherever you have these hard spots at that is also where plankton gets condensed and gets the thickest and gathers on the lake. Therefore, that's why the bait fish show up in those areas. Therefore, that's why the bass show up in those areas. I've heard some people say in the past, and I'm talking about some people that know what they're talking about with fish and say, yeah, the bass, man, it's just, you know, in summertime, they like those shell beds, rock. It's like a tile floor. It's cooler to them. Dude, that ain't got nothing to do with it. Like, <laughs> they're there to eat, bro. Like, the, the fish think about two things in their entire life. Eating and reproducing. And reproducing is done for the year. They only do it once a year. It's done for the year. So now all they think about is eating. That's it. Their whole goal in life is just to feed efficiently and gain weight. That's how they stay alive. That's what drives them, right? So these fish don't care about a tile floor. What are you laughing at? It sounds like a fishing guide to me. You're explaining it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it kind of does. There's some good similarities there. Uh, but these fish don't care about the softness or the firmness of the bottom. I don't really think they do. Maybe there's something if you have like some dirtier water, it's harder for them. They don't feel as good because they can't breathe as good in dirty water as they can in clean water or something to that maybe. I can, I can go along with some of those theories. But they don't care out in the main lake where the water content's all the same. They don't care if they're on a soft bottom or hard bottom. They care that they can eat, right? They care that they're safe and that they can eat. 
So they like cover, they like stumps, they like brush, they like things like that, but mainly they like to eat. So wherever those bait fish gather, that's where these bass are going to gather. And that's why these hard spots have become so prevalent in what we look for on Lake Fork and, and have become such a key to all of our success when we're having successful days. You're always around a hard spot. And like you can even feel it. Like when we're throwing baits out there and dragging them on the bottom, these big three quarter ounce jigs, Carolina rigs, big shaky heads, you feel the difference in bottom content. And I know I tell my customers, and I know from my experience, every time I get a bite, it's on a hard spot. Yeah. And you'll tell your customer, okay, you're going to throw out there, it'll feel mushy. When you start feeling the bottom change, you feel it get harder, That that's where you need to start paying attention. Be ready for your bite right in there. Pay attention, and I always slow down. Slow you. down on those hard spots, fishing more thoroughly, yes, absolutely. So that is what Lake Fork offshore fishing has become all about. I will tell you, with the pressure the Lake Fork receives, the lake being down, it's fishing smaller. Everybody's pretty much fishing main lake structure, especially with modern electronics. Everybody's an offshore fisherman now. Used to be. A lot of guys, the majority of guys would stay shallow year round and there wasn't that many guys that would fish offshore. With today's electronics, everybody fishes offshore. And on Lake Fork, sometimes it's just getting away from people. And so there are hard spots and good little offshore spots that aren't obvious on Navionics. They're not where you think they would be. They're not on the crest of the point. They're not on the most obvious hump. They're on something that doesn't really show up on Navionics or maybe it's a big point but they're on the side of it on a hard spot where nobody's fishing. Um, so finding these out of the way hard spots to me has become so critical uh, in catching these fish. And I will tell you guys, one way that you can do that is we have this thing called the Fish Life app. And it's always getting updated every single month. And if I'm catching the fish off the side of the point, the waypoint that we put on that point is gonna be where I'm catching them. So you guys can see the exact spots and go to these special hard spots that we're finding by subscribing to the Fish Life app, Lake Fork Premium Package. The life is spelled with a Y, L-Y-F-E. Uh, I know you've had access to the Fish Life app over the years. I know you've seen it. Um, you're just a guy on Lake Fork. Yes, we're buddies, but you don't get any benefit from plugging the Fish Life app, just so everybody know. No. You have nothing to gain by telling everybody how great the app is. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that app? All right, so, you know, I've said in the past that the Fish Life app is a great tool. And it's a great tool not not only to fish the spots that he has marked, but to duplicate it. Okay, so you've got to think, you know, yes, you are one of 500 people that's going to be using a Fish Life app or more. So you're going to know that those spots are going to be kind of covered up. You know well, they're going to get fished off yeah. that one, yeah, for so, sure. So you're going to want to try to look at what he's got marked on your Navionics and try to duplicate that. And once you kind of play with it a little bit, you're going to figure that out, and you're going to have a lot more success. And, you know, even on the Fish Life app where he explains what baits you need to throw or can throw, you know, th throw what you're used to as well because those fish have, uh, have been seeing that bait, so just the slightest change will make a big difference. In Sometimes that. it can. I so. use the Fish Life app because I do the spots on Lake Fork. We have partners on other lakes on our other premium packages in the region. We have, you know, Louisville, Hubbard, Levon, Grapevine, Texoma, uh, Rayburn, Toledo, Athens, you know, and you guys seeing some of the videos when I go places, I'm using the app. You saw one on Rayburn with me and the princess a little while ago. Uh, I was on Lake Athens just the other day and I pulled out the app. Now, the bait I started throwing was one of the baits they listed, but the bait I caught them better on was a different. I think it's a shaky head. Started with a shaky head, then tried a Carolina rig, and I caught them better on a Carolina rig. So, mm -hmm. you're right. Just I mean, you don't have to stick to just those baits. You can still go fish it your way. And you're right about duplicating. Like if you're seeing that I've got a couple of hard spots that I've located on the side of a main lake point, well, next time you go look at a different main lake point of your own, instead of graphing the tip of it or just the crest of it that everybody's graphing and looking for fish on, you might go over and look on the side, yeah. kind of in a similar type of area where I showed you a hard spot on another point. So yeah. it's invaluable, man. It's, it's, it's definitely more information and more accurate information than you've ever been able to find in the world of bass fishing anywhere. 100%. Would you agree with that? Uh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, I've got a three foot by three foot sticker on my back window to prove that. That's true. You do have a big fish slot <laughs> sticker. You sure do. You sure do, man. So. so all right, so that's it. It's about finding these hard spots on offshore structure. Uh, on your electronics, use those to locate fish. I know a lot of you guys want to know what baits do you throw on these offshore fish. Uh, that's going to be a big part of it. What baits to throw, how to throw them, how to present them, all that stuff. I'm going to give you guys some baits that I've been throwing that have been working really good for me. 
I know me and Cody have some of the same baits as I'm sitting here looking at some of his baits he has out. Uh, we have some of the same baits that we've been throwing. Uh, but I'm going to give you guys a couple that are a little off the beaten path that we haven't talked about much lately. Uh, this week especially, the Carolina Rig Bubble Fry has come on for me, for me. And the Carolina Rig yesterday and today has kind of started to take over the bites in my boat. It really has. Um, I was using chartreuse pepper, but I've gone to Plum Fleck. I think anything on your plastics right now that is pink, purple, or red is good. That's the best color, pink, purple, and red. Those are the best colors on your plastics, whether it's on a Carolina rig, a shaky head, a wobble head, however you want to throw it. Those are the colors. Uh, swing heads, wobble heads, whatever you want to call them. These pivoting three-quarter ounce football heads where the hook can just swing free like this. Biffle heads, I think a lot of people, Tommy Biffle invented this. Great, great presentation tactic that honestly not a lot of people use on Lake Fork. The, 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 talking about things that fish don't see as much, this is one of them right here. And you know, I've got a little creature bait on here. You guys can use whatever kind of creature bait you want. I just want something short and compact with appendages that swim a lot. You know, appendages that'll wiggle a lot. But those two baits, a Carolina Rig Bubble Fry and a swing head with a little creature bait on it has been very, very good for me the last week or two. And I know you've been throwing that shaky head worm. Why don't we start off Tell us about the shaky head worm you use, because I know we've both been using that a lot. Yeah. And I'm still getting bites on that as well. So. And, and you know, so you're saying the Carolina rig has been your majority bite. So it's been the exact opposite for me. You know, a week or two ago, that's all we were catching them on, or mainly catching them on, was Carolina rig. And for me... It may just have to do with the schools of fish that we've been fishing. My schools are tired of seeing the shaky head. Yeah. Now they're about a Carolina... Your schools are tired of seeing the Carolina rig. Now they're about a shaky head. Okay. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Yeah. So, you know, and just like his colors, you know, we're going to be throwing a plum, a purple, uh, with, with some flake in it. So that is a seven inch worm. Uh, this worm here will catch your big fish and it will catch your good unders. Uh, we have caught several, several good healthy unders on these right here uh, in a plum color. Um, throwing it on a three eighths or a five eighths uh, shaky head. Um, depends on the wind. You know, if the wind picks up, you're gonna to wanna to use a heavier one. That way you can feel that hard bottom like he was talking about. That way you can slow down and fish it thoroughly. So um, on the seven inch worm, I'm throwing a three eighths or five eighths ounce uh, shaky head. All right, on the next one, we're going up to a seven eighths with a 10 aught hook with big perm. That's old smash tag. That's the one everybody's been buying. Yeah. Yeah. And plum apple. And that's it exact. So I ran out of my fake out color. Remember we talk about fake out color. It's kind of a pinkish purplish color. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran out of that, and there's none around the lake. You guys bought them all. So thank y'all <laughs> for doing that. But also screw y'all for doing that because I couldn't even get no more. Man. And uh, <laughs> so I've gone over to <clears throat> plum apple from Smash Tech. I, and like I said, I think anything red, pink, or purple is good. Would I maybe get a few more bites on fake out? Probably so. But uh, this plum apple's been getting bites just fine. It still gets bites every day. And, and the thing that I will say, Cody, and you can back me up or, or argue with me or disagree or however you want to do it, on this big magnum crawler, I don't catch very many unders. Now, I mean, every once in a while. But for the most part, it's slot fish, and every once in a while I'll get an over on it. Yep. Is it? So, yes, I will catch uh, under fish with it. But when you do, they are sure enough. They big are, under. That is true. They the unders that I have caught are like, that's a check. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so when you're fishing in these tournaments, you know, like as, as a guy, we have a luxury of having multiple people in our boat to where we can throw different baits and target fish differently. We throw a Carolina rig, a yeah. shaky head, a jig. So the all best at once. advice I can give you is do not throw the same bait yeah. unless you find that that's what they're hitting. You know, so, you know, one, one person throw the bigger worm and then the other one throw the smaller worm. You know, you both have chances of catching an over or an under with both of these, but you can kind of see what profile that those fish are wanting, whether they're wanting the bigger profile or the more finesse profile. Yeah. So that, that would be a, a big, you know, positive of what y'all need to do tomorrow. Would you say, so, you know, you can always go for the over, and there's plenty of overs to be caught on Lake Fork right now. There's going to be a lot of overs caught in this tournament. But if you're a guy in this event and you just want to, you know, maybe first thing, first morning, tomorrow morning, you want to just try to get your money back real quick. Yep. Try to make a couple of checks, whatever. So you want to target unders. Would you, if that was your game plan, would you downsize your, would you go to say a quarter or three ounce, three, a quarter or three eighths ounce shaky head with the smaller six or seven inch worm? Or would you go on and fish the eight or nine inch and just 
I hope you caught an under. So, all right. So, I'm a little backwards than most people. Y'all, y'all have always known this. Um, I'm going to go for the bigger fish early in the morning. I'm okay. going to go for the big one first. Um, yeah. I have caught the majority of my big fish in these tournaments early. Really? Yes. And that's the opposite of what most people would tell you. Yeah. A lot of people tell you you catch your bigger fish right in the middle of the day. But you know why? Because in these tournaments, most of your people are beating the banks with topwaters or, or swim yeah. swim jigs or whatever. I'm still seeing a lot of people pull up shallow early in the morning. Yeah. I could not disagree with that strategy more right now at this point. I was throwing topwaters until this week early in the morning, and that deal has kind of gone away. And the only bites I was getting, I was having to get there at 6 a.m. to get a decent topwater bite even last week. But that early shallow deal – Yes, you can catch some fish up there, but you can also start catching them out deep early, and to me, you have a better chance of rolling into old big yep, that's right. out there. That's right. And, you know, a lot of people's strategy in this is, is hold your fish. You know, everybody has that strategy. So when you're holding your fish towards the later part of the day, you have less chance of winning money. That is a factor that I know from my days of fishing these hourly big bass tournaments. It is much easier to cast a check in the first hour yep. than any other hour of the day. A lot of times, a 180 or a 190, a 1.8, 1.9, you know, 14 inch fish will get a good check in the first hour. Yeah, it, it does happen. It does, and the reason might not happen this year because the fish in Lake Fork are pretty fat this year. They are fat yeah. this year, but the risk versus reward on that is is worth it. But you know, I know what y'all are thinking. Well, man, you know, this is my spot. I'm wanting to fish this morning. If I go run up there and weigh in might when I come back I'm not might not get back on it and I mean I understand that that's just something that you're going to have that's a decision to, you got to yeah, make that's right yeah. so but yeah. it is easier to catch checks early than that it, typically on, in almost every event it gets progressively the the weight at the bottom of the check line so they're paying I don't know how many places they pay in owner's term but let's say they're paying 10 places per hour the, the weight in 10th place goes up progressively as the day goes on it gets harder and harder to cut a check as the day goes on. Yep, it does. Um, I forgot where I was going to go. Especially that last hour, dude. Yeah. That last hour. <laughs> that last hour. Because every everybody's bringing every fish in they have. That last hour, every turn I've ever been, you know what I do with the fish I got in love with? Throw them out. I throw it out and go to the boat ramp. Yeah. <laughs> so, Beat the traffic at the boat ramp. Hell right. yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, what I would probably do in the morning is try to find a spot to where you have deep water access and shallow water access to where you don't have to move. You can throw this way on your top water baits or chatter baits or whatever and pick up, you know, some good unders and possibly some, uh, an over. I mean, an over is always roaming shallow eating in the mornings as well. Um, and then you can turn around and start fishing the deeper side of it. Yeah. And you don't have to move. So, yeah. you know, I mean, the best strategy, everybody's dream is, I mean, let's just go out there first hour and catch your three fish. Catch your over and two unders and be done for the day. Then go sit at the way That's there. right. Take your turn <laughs> in the hours. Yeah, that is the strategy. Right. So what you're saying, though, is find a spot that has maybe a steeper drop or mm -hmm. something where where you've got one of those hard spots out there somewhere, but you can sit right here and cast that hard spot out in 15 foot of water, 17 foot of water. Yeah. But from that same spot, you can turn around and cast the other way and fish in two or three foot of water. That's right. So that is an ideal situation. You can't just find that everywhere, but if you can find one of those, that is ideal. Yeah. Because you can not You can start your day off throwing up shallow, like you said, and then as the morning progresses, just turn around and throw out the other side. Yeah, and just know, I mean, if you're, you're throwing off of that deep side and you're not catching nothing, I mean, don't get discouraged and, and leave too early because these fish right now are roaming, and they're coming in and out yes. and in and out. I have a spot on the lake. You've seen me fishing. You have a spot very close to it that you've been fishing. It's a little shallower. But I have an offshore spot, and it's a hard spot, shell bed, rock. I don't know what it is. It's a hard spot. It's what it is. Um, and I'll pull up there and set up on that. And if they're there, I'll set up on it. And we'll catch two or three, and then they'll leave. But then I'll just wait. I don't move the boat. I don't take it off spot lock. I don't wander around, hit it from a different angle, none of that. I just sit right there, and they come back. I actually sat on that spot yesterday morning for three hours. For three hours, I sat on spot lock and didn't flinch. And we kept making the same cast of the same stretch out there. And we would get two or three bites, and then we'd go 30 or 40 minutes without a bite. And then we'd get two or three bites, and then we'd go 30 or 40 minutes without a bite. And we did that, and we ended up having eight or 10 bites out there. Now, 
we did have a hard time landing fish on that spot yesterday for whatever reason. We didn't catch as many as we should have for sure. But we caught several fish off of it and uh, caught some really good fish off, big slot fish off of it. And um, you can see them on 360. Because you'll pull up there, you graph them with your console graph, pull up, set up, catch a few. And you're just sitting there and it's like they go away. They're not on your 360 anymore. And then after a while, you'll see one or two come back in. Then you'll see four, five, six, eight or ten come back in. And you can kind of see them as your 360 pings around mm -hmm. starting to show up. Sure enough, every time they start to show up, you start getting some more bites. Yeah. So these hard spots, that's the other thing to keep in mind about these hard spots. They are feeding grounds. They're dinner tables. This is where these fish come to eat. So they're going to pull up there and eat. And then you bust the school up catching a couple of whatever, they might leave. It's just a matter of time before some come back. Maybe the same ones, maybe a different group, whatever. It's a matter of time. These are feeding spots that these fish are patrolling all day and pulling up to eat and then moving on to the next one or moving on to just suspend and rest, and then they'll pull back up and eat. And this time of year, as the lake water temps get warmer and warmer, their metabolism picks up more and more, they're going to visit those more and more often. You know, So we're really in that time of year where you can camp on a spot and have fish come to you all day, especially in a situation like this, where there's so many boats on the lake, if you've got a good spot that's holding fish, mm -hmm. you probably best to just stay there yep. and let those fish come to you, because they're coming. Yep, and if I, I've got, I got two important things that I want to tell y'all, most important, all right? So I'm a firm believer, everything happens for a reason, okay? So the first thing you need to do is pack your lunch. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, from tournament fishing, I used to go all day without drinking or eating anything. And it affects you more than you know. Okay, you get hungry, you start getting agitated, you start working that bait differently. You need to make sure you stop and you eat something. To and, stay, where, and stay hydrated in yes. this heat. Yeah. Stay hydrated in this heat. That way you can keep the same level head all day while you're fishing. Because I promise you, when I realized that, it made a big difference for me. All right, the second thing is, if somebody comes in on you on your spot and they are crowding you, don't get mad, don't cause a scene. If you have to, if, they, if they're belligerent, you know, get their, their registration number and handle it that way. But the main thing is, if you feel like you need to leave, you need to follow your gut instinct. I don't know how many times in these tournaments that I've been fishing a spot and I start catching fish and people roll up on me so close to where I can almost hit them with the rod tip when I'm casting, okay? I'd get so mad and then I'd leave. And I'd, while I was leaving his pocket, I would work the bank down where them people just came from. And I have caught overs after overs after overs. <laughs> the little, little karma working. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So I'm just, that's why I'm saying everything happens for a reason. Follow your gut instincts. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, the reality is nobody's life is going to change because of this tournament. Right. Like, nothing in your life is going to change because of this tournament, okay? And, 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 you know, even at the Bassmaster level, if you win or you lose, your family is not going to think any differently of you. Everybody that you care about in your life is not going to care. You know, if you win, they'll congratulate you for a couple days, and then they won't care. If you <laughs> lose... They'll tell you, man, I'm sorry, you can go your way. And then they won't care. Yeah. Like, there is nothing going on in this tournament that's worth losing your cool over or even letting it really get you in a bad mood or feel upset about it. I mean, is it right for somebody to come in on you and throw it the same school you're throwing at? Nope, it's not right. Yeah. It's not right. But you can't control them, and it's not worth letting it run your day. No, I mean, it's no different than catching a few fish out of a school, and it messes up their mentality. Yeah. They go away and they start doing different things and you're going to do the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Don't don't let that stuff get to you. Uh, a, encourage all of y'all to just be kind and courteous to each other. The lake's super crowded in these events. It's fishing small. The lake is smaller. It's about 5,000 surface acres, five or 6,000 surface acres smaller than normally. It's normally 27, 28,000. Right now it's about 22,000 acres uh, surface. So the lake is smaller and it's all offshore fishing or main lake type fishing so that takes away a lot of the creek arms the lake is fishing small it's going to be extremely crowded out there you guys communicate and work together i cannot express to you how much a little bit of open friendly communication can do for you on the water if me and cody didn't know each other from adam and he was fishing a point and i wanted to fish that point and i'm having a hard time finding a spot to fish because the lake's so crowded 
man, if I roll up 100 feet from Cody and go, hey, bud, do you mind if I share this point with you, man? It's just crowded out here, and I ain't got no – man, there's yeah. hardly anywhere for me to fish. I know I've been catching some fish here. Do you mind if I share this with you? He's going to go, absolutely not. Then I'm going to go, where are you fishing so I don't get in your way? And he's like, well, we're casting that area over there. Or we're working this way. Okay, I'll start right here and go the other way, or, or I'll cast over here. Or he may even go, dude, they're right there, cast in there with me. Let's catch them. You know, and that would probably be his reaction on him. That would be my reaction. I'll tell you, no, school's right there, dude. Fire in and get you one. Yep. You know, like, if you just have some open, friendly communication with each other instead of when a guy rolls in, your reaction is, what the hell is he doing? Is this guy really doing this? Like, why is he doing that? I've had that reaction. We, I have that reaction all the time. Like, especially when the lake's not crowded in the middle of the week and people do it, I'm like, why on earth is this guy doing this? <laughs> Don't have that reaction this weekend, boys. I'm telling you, it ain't going to do you no good. And if you were in that guy's shoes, he probably feels justified in what he's doing, coming as close to you as he is. He probably either doesn't know he's doing anything wrong or, or thinks that I don't have a choice. You know, there's nowhere to fish. So um, just be courteous to each other, communicate with each other, and everybody have a good time because that's what this tournament's all about anyway, man. It's about having fun, enjoying the sport, enjoying the camaraderie, and enjoying a special – special fishery that's Lake Fork and a great company in Skeeter Boats and a great tournament organization in Bass Champs. I cannot say enough for Bass Champs and, and the tournaments that they put on and the job they do for us in the fishing community. Yep. Yeah, yeah, amazing. All their tournaments are great. Yeah, I think they're the best one. I mean, you fished a lot of the tournaments, you know, at Lake Fork recently and uh, I think they put on the best of it. They do. I mean, the only one that I really, I mean, kind of don't like, uh, if for people that know me, they know what I'm about to say, uh, is the Berkeley tournament. I cannot <laughs> stand Berkeley. Bates. Has nothing to do with bass champs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Has to do with being restricted to Berkeley baits, and I feel you on that. But I am so competitive. I'm not not going to fish the tournament yeah. just because of that. You know? Well, didn't you like win something big at a Berkeley tournament? No, it wasn't Berkeley. Oh, okay. uh, you know, I've won some hours in the Berkeley uh, as, as long as, you know, Vic uh, Pearsall as well, you know. Um, but no, Berkeley wasn't our, our biggest our biggest. Okay. Thing, so. Okay. But. Well, I guess we need to start opening up to some questions. We normally have a live audience to get questions at these seminars at the marina, but we got a virtual audience tonight, so uh, you guys go ahead and ask us some questions, and we'll be happy to answer. I'm going to scroll and see if y'all have already asked questions. Justin Barfield asked a question. He said, opinions on the Six Sense Flow Glider. Man, you know, I've worked with Six Sense for a long time, and I've also never lied to you guys. So <laughs> sometimes, every once in a while, you get me in a hard spot because here's all I'll say. I feature the baits that work for me. I feature the baits, and I tell you guys all the details about the baits that are really good and work for me. I think that's safe. I think that'll keep me out of trouble. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying anything bad about the flow glider. I'm just saying that if I'm using a bait and it works for me, you guys see it on this channel and I'll tell you everything I know about it. It's hell good. No, I can't see them comments. If you don't use my phone. Oh, know. here we go. That way. Trying to look through you guys' comments to find questions. If you have more questions, just let me know. Oh, we didn't tell a story about that fish on the thumbnail for this thing. Oh, yeah. We got to do that. For you sure. guys throw some questions in there. We'll get to them. Cody, man, uh, the fish in the thumbnail is a 12-pounder. 12, yeah, 12, 12, five. 12, five. And you had a little little hand in this fish. Tell me about it. Yeah, so uh, my uncle. Uh, that's your uncle. That's my uncle. That's yeah. your uncle holding yeah. the fish. Yeah, so he got into fishing. So your uncle hole buzzer did you? No, no, oh, he okay. didn't hole me. No, no. I tell you know he can, he can. I'm just like you. If you see me on a spot, man, come on and yeah. join me. I don't care. It don't bother me. You still a hole buzzer though? Yeah, I'm gonna call you. A hole yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah. But no, man, he he's he getting into fish. He's getting real big into it. He's doing a great job, man. He's he's catching a lot of big fish and quality fish. Um, so you know, one morning he uh, he called me and said, "Hey, you know, I'm not really having any luck on top water." And uh, I was like, "Man, you know, it's kind of hit or miss here and there, you know." But uh, I told him, I said, "I've been having success on top water on docks. Um, they're up in there feeding on the shad and the in the brim, and the perch on these docks." Go in there and throw a, a walking bait or a popper or okay. whatever. Okay. Please tell me he caught this fish on top. No, okay. no, he didn't. Right. No, he didn't. So they're fishing these docks, rows of docks down, and they, and they've caught a few. And uh, he come, he says he pulls up to this one dock, and uh, it's got a brush pile in it. So he's like, I'm gonna throw it that brush pile. He reaches over and he grabs that plum worm right here on shaky yeah. head, pitches it in there, and he said. He was dragging it and he felt a little tick and he stopped. He drug it a few more inches, felt a little tick. He stopped, he pulled it again and then it hit it, not very hard. He said he hit it so he set the hook and when he set the hook, he was just slow reeling it in. He thought it was a, you know, a little tick. Normal fish. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he said um, whenever he got up the boat, he was reeling down just to go ahead and boat flip it. And he said whenever he got that fish up to the top, He's like, oh my gosh, and that fish went straight under the, the boat. The fish saw the boat and freaked out? <laughs> yes. Oh, man. But he was reeling it like it was a two-pounder, just like, ah, oh, it's just another you know, little yeah. fish, you know. And uh, uh, my other uncle, which are twins, the other uncle get the, got the net out and got it netted. And, you know, that, that that's an amazing. I wish I was there to share that moment with him because that, that's, that's truly amazing. But, you know, before that, and I'm not going to say it's in the same area. I'm not going to give his spots away. Yeah, but no, no, no. In the same area, a few weeks before, actually when the elites were here. Okay. Uh, he went out, because uh, he don't get to fish a whole lot because he, he, he owns some uh, some roofing businesses okay. and does all that. So when he gets to go fish, he's going to go fish. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he went out and he caught one that was 27 inches long just a few weeks prior to that. Golly. All right, so 27 inches long. Yes, and Jeez. man, he felt so sick to his stomach because he lost his fish after getting it in the boat. All right, so uh, I'm not trying. Whoa, to get... he lost it after getting it into the boat. After getting it in, I the want boat. an explanation here. All right, so I'm not trying to get too personal in his business, but let's just say he had something wrong with his hands and he had to have surgery. So he don't have a whole lot of strength in his hands. Okay. So he gets the fish in the boat. He measures it. Well, then my other uncle's right down the bank from him and says, let me see it. So he goes to pick the fish up, and whenever he did, she flopped, and she went right out the boat. <gasps> so he didn't get to get a weight. A 27-inch fish? Yeah, he didn't get a weight or a picture. He was sick to his stomach, okay? I'm sure he's in here watching. Uh, he, he's going to watch tonight, but he was so sick. He's like, I'm never going to be able to redeem that. You know what I mean? A 27-inch fish? Yeah. Yeah, that's you don't catch very many of those. No. Like, ever? No. It's huge. And I told him, I said, man, just keep your head up. How long was the 12.5 that he caught? The 12.5, I believe he said it was uh, 26 and a half. 26 and a half? Yeah. Now, was the other one fat like that one? No. No, no skinnier? It was skinnier. But he was still over 10 pounds for sure. Oh, yeah. It was a, for, for sure. sure a double digit, yeah. And that would have been, was his first double digit. Yeah. And he doesn't even know what it weighed. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, my real question is, and we need to get him to comment this maybe, is what type of vice grip apparatus – trot line, uh, chain link fence. What did he put on this fish when he got in the boat to make sure he didn't do that again? Well, I told him, I said, hey, next time you do that, put that sucker in the bottom of the boat. Never hold it anywhere <laughs> but the bottom. Like, yeah. if somebody wants to see you tell them to come over and look down. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Keep it in the bottom of the boat till you do Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, so, my goodness. You know, he was like, man, I'm not going to be able to redeem myself. You know, that was the biggest fish of my life, probably. And I told him, I said, man, just keep your head up. Man, I promise you, you will have more chances. Yeah. And sure so, enough, right after that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That makes it even better. Makes it even better. Billy Snow said it was awesome to watch how proud Cody was of his uncle that day. I guess he was with you that day. Yeah, he was. Yeah. There we go. Well, I guess we must be doing a good job explaining how to catch these fish because we ain't got no questions. So. Huh. You guys ain't asking no questions. You ain't going to ask no questions. We ain't going to give you no answers. You know why they're not asking questions? Because I'm on this side of the phone tonight. And I'm usually stirring stuff up in there. You, you, know? you do. Yeah. You do stir stuff up on the other side of the camera in that seminar. Yeah, you yeah. do. Now, it's always funny, those seminars, too, when we have, like, the live audience. It's the same reaction we're getting from this audience. You go through all this talk, and you'll be rattling off stuff for 30 minutes or whatever. 
He goes, anybody got any questions? And they're like, nobody wants to be the first one to speak up. And then finally somebody, and I'll ramble like I'm doing now, myself, finally somebody will ask something, and then everybody, then we'll have 30 more minutes of questions. Yep, yep. That's the way it goes every time, every time. So we're just waiting on one of you guys to break through and ask a question, and we'll answer. <laughs> What's the water temp? Water temp's right around 80. I mean, it's low 80s. For the most part now, it's broken over into the low 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's climbing. It was after those cold fronts at the end of the lease series, it got all the way back down around 70 degrees. It did. So it's been climbing pretty pretty steady rate of climb on the water temp here lately. And it's gonna continue to climb, continue to climb. Uh, with these temperatures, we got 100 degree temperatures coming up right now. And 90s all next week. Uh, somebody just asked what your PB is, Cody. All right, so my PB is a little over 13. It was 13.1, 13 pound, one ounce. Um, I actually caught that with my grandfather. Um, believe it or not. Who used to be? No, this is the different grandpa. Oh, different, the other grandpa. No, okay. Yeah, the other grandpa. One of your grandpas used to be a guy on Lake Four. Yeah, Don Powell. Yeah. So the other grandpa you caught. The, so both of your grandpas were like fishing. Things. Oh, yes. Yes. So yeah. one was more bass, the other one was crappie catfish. Okay. And that's the one you caught the 13 with? Yeah, it was the crappie. Oh. We were crappie fishing and when I caught of that one. But, Fucking crappie guys, man. Y'all always kiss the Giants. Look at Josh Jones. Like, the the best trophy bass fisherman of our generation is a crappie guy. Yeah. It's <laughs> something about those crappie guys, man. They catch them big. Um, but as far as, the, like, my PB on an artificial bait uh, is a 12.9. So you oh, you got a 13.1 on a minnow or something? Yeah, it was a minnow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, but. Which side of the lake is producing best? I've been getting asked this questions this question a lot on live streams lately and my answer is i know you guys hate this answer the whole lake like i'm running the entire lake i, I can't tell you that well the east arm is better or the lower ends better or the you know up the west arm like i'm going to all of it and there's guides fishing all of it and we're catching fish on all of it like i know one spot we talked about right before we started that you've been fishing is way up one side of the lake, and then the spot that I ended my day on and caught him yesterday is way up the other side of the lake. And the spot that we've been seeing each other on is all the way down at the south end of the lake. And I mean, we're fishing the whole lake, guys. The whole lake is fishing good, top to bottom. The main thing is the main lake aspect. It's all main lake oriented, main lake structure oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Do the bigger fish usually run together? I I don't know if I'm seeing different schools of fish pop in and out on these spots. But I'll go in spurts. For me, I'll go in spurts on spots. Like, I'll catch some two to four pounders, and then I'll catch some five to eight pounders. And, and they're, they're together, but on the same spot. You know what I mean? Like, it's like there's different pods of different size fish that are pulling up on there at different times. So they are kind of grouping by size. And usually as the summer goes on, they do that more and more and more. Uh, but you can catch different size fish on the same cast, on the same line, just not usually right at the same time right now. Right. For me, for me. What about you? No, it's about the same. I mean, um, we're either catching slots or we're catching unders. Uh, very rarely are we catching more of one or more of the other, though. Okay. So, I mean, it is more mixed for, for my, the schools that I'm in. Like see it be mixed up a little bit? Whether they're separate schools that are coming in here and there, or if it's the same school that are just mixed, I, I, I can't tell you that. Yeah. But, okay. but yeah, no. Yeah, it does seem to be like that for me, though, where, like, if you're catching, you know, unders and small slot fish, you'll catch those for a little while, and then you'll catch bigger ones for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then you'll go back to catching little ones for a little while. It just It's not like I'm catching two-pounder, seven-pounder, three-pounder, six-pounder. You know, it hasn't been working like that for me for whatever reason. So I think, I think in my head, it seems like that is what's going on. They are running in, in groups by size, but there's just pods of fish pulling up on these spots to eat, like we talked about. It's like this school pulling there, then a bigger group will kind of run them off, pull in there, and then they'll go away, then this group will come back. And I think that's what's going on. At least that seems like the most likely uh, scenario. Father Day from the kids is the mega sack from Six Cents. Looking forward to getting that. I bet you are, dude. Hell yeah. That's the cool thing about being a fishing dude is like all these Father's Days, birthdays, Christmas. It's real easy to buy stuff for us. You can never have too much fishing stuff. Not possible. Not <laughs> possible. Still fishing the dam or cooled off? Um, you know, I did that that one day in that video. I 
probably fished that stretch on the dam maybe two or three times in total. Um, uh, so the topwater bite in general that I was, you know, John Cox showed us that topwater bite on the dam. Then I went down there and got there late one day and only caught one on it. But I did go on one or two guide trips down there and catch a few topwater fish. Um, but, man, I'm, I've got a couple of bridge aprons that I've been doing it on. I've got a couple of points I've been doing it on. And I know you've been fishing topwaters on points some with the steeper slopes on them. Um, that deal's kind of gone away for me. I mean, I, I really, especially the last few days here, that topwater bite is just faded. Yeah. You know, Monday we had a little bit um, that morning, but then after that, the rest of this week, it's, and I've gotten to where, like, this morning I didn't even go pursue it. Yeah, I've had mornings like that. So Wednesday morning, uh, me and my clients go out. We caught two on top water. We, we got out there at 545. Uh, by 615, I said, the heck with this. Yeah. We're going deep. So, yeah. Yeah, that top water bite just really isn't. It's fading. Yeah. It's going away. Yeah. It's going away. All right, we're caught up on questions now. We're going to need some more questions to keep this thing going, folks. Can't fish the fourth tournament this year. How can I donate my entry fee? Well, thank you very much. That's amazing. Uh, but you can just go to the One Tribe Foundation website and donate whatever you would like to directly through them. They have a donation link on their website. and It would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. All right, you guys fire us another question or two. We'll keep this thing going. If not, we're going to wrap it up here shortly. What are you doing, Cody? I'm just going back through them. See Reading if we comments. Miss there you yeah. go. Got here a little bit late. How big did Cody say the hook was on that shaky head with a big perm? Uh, that is a 10 aught. That's a like 7 8 ounce shaky head with a 10 aught hook. Yep. That's crazy. It's a big old hook. Which is better right now, morning, afternoon, or evening bite? What do you think? Well, man, by, by the time I get off the lake at 3.30, I'm ready to go home. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> staying for that evening bite. No, These guys to. that run these like, I'm going to fish a full day and then a half day behind it, more power to you, bro. Yeah. Like, I think them guys take half the year off in the fall of winter or something because <laughs> I, I ain't got enough gas for that year round, dude. Ain't no way. Ain't no way. You know, when I first started guiding, I did, you know, because I was trying to, you know, get out there more. But now, I mean, I'm not much older, but I, I just, I can't do it. No. I can't. My, I'm, I've settled in to nine hours a day is my deal. But to answer the question, is the morning, middle of the day, or afternoon my better? To me, it kind of goes like this. First thing in the morning, the offshore bite, the offshore bite first thing in the morning, it's there, but it's a little bit slower. Like when I say first thing in the morning, I mean like from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. The offshore bite's a little bit slower. Then from about 8 a.m. until lunchtime, 10.30, 11 o'clock, 11.30, 12. Anywhere in that window, the offshore bite is banging, dude. It's getting it. Like it's good. If you graph them, you'll pretty much catch them for the most part. Mm -hmm. Then about 11 noon, it gets to a point where it's just slower. Like, you can still catch some out of it. The schools become a little hard to find on your graph. They're a little fewer and far between when you see a school pulled up on your hard spots and then your structure. You just don't see as many schools out there. And then even sometimes when you do see a school, you may not get a bite out of it sometimes in the middle of the day. So there is a midday lull, but that midday lull is not you can't catch anything. Mm -hmm. There You can still catch some on Lake Fork in that midday lull, you're just not going to catch as many. You're not going to catch them as fast. You may have to, when you find a school and grab it, you may have to fish 20 or 30 minutes, 40 minutes, before you get a bite out of that school sometimes. Um, so it does slow down right in the middle of the day. Now, I've heard from guys that are fishing in the evening that late, late in the day, 6 o'clock or later, it does kick on and they bite really good again. Uh, that's just what I've heard, though. So uh, there is a little bit of a midday lull, but it, you're not out of the fight. And you... You do catch some really big bass in the middle of the day at times. Like some of the bigger ones will bite on those deeper water spots in the middle of the day. Yeah, and when that lull happens, so what I normally do with my customers is we'll, uh, we'll either go focus on brush piles, uh, any, you know, any type of offshore structure that these fish can get up under, get in, um, and that usually will get us a few more bites. So, yeah, I'm just doing that. Man, I just keep fishing the same stuff. Just keep using my electronics. For me, I'm a, I'm a big electronics guy. Like, I'm I'm big on console electronics. I'm big on Humberbird 360. Um, I'm really just focusing on, I don't even stop until I see them with my electronics. So, I'm just graphing. Like, I may spend, and that from 11 o'clock till 
that's what four and a half hours i may spend two hours of that in sitting in the seat of my boat driving around looking for fish on my graph and then when i see them i try to catch them but i'm just not going to stop till i see them it's all about electronics it's all about finding that school of fish in a position where i think they're going to bite mm-hmm. and then once i see that i'll be methodical and take my time in that school uh, but that's that's my deal in the middle of the day What do you think about split trips like Easy E runs? It's Eric Wright, great Lake Fork guide. Eric's a good dude, man. Really good fishing guide on Lake Fork. Um, he, yeah, some guys will run morning trips and then take the middle of the day off and then run evening trips. Eric lives right on the lake. Okay, uh, no offense to Eric, but his kids are still young. Um, if you're a family guy, and you, you know, you don't live on the lake. Like I live 30 minutes away from the lake. Uh, that that's a hard deal to do to just sit at the lake from daylight till dark in the summertime when that is 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's 15 hours away from home and Eric can go home in the middle of the day I can't and that's probably the biggest thing he can go home see his kids hang out whatever in the middle of the day while he takes those splits I I've never run those split days I don't have any plans on running those split days um, it's just not practical for me I used to do a lot when the lake was up because I could just pull right up there to the my boat ramp. And, yeah, because you live on the lake too. Yeah, and and I'm gonna do that. You know, I do that in the summer too. You know, I'm running night trips. Yeah. Uh, so, I'll uh, I'll get off the water by three o'clock, go plug the boat in, charge it, and get back out by five six o'clock and go out. But but I'm definitely gonna be taking a nap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you the nine hours is a sweet spot. Like if I start at six a.m., we got till about three o'clock, and then I gotta go. Because if I stay out more than nine hours, I got about a week until I'm going to be just feeling terrible. Yeah. And like not have, I'm just going to die, dude. I'm going to be worn out, you know? So. All right. I think we've caught up with all the questions. Not seeing a whole lot of more questions coming in, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up, man. Cody, thank you. No, appreciate it. Thank coming you. and driving down here 30 minutes away from the lake to come hang out <laughs> with me and uh, do this seminar, a little different live stream. Then what we normally do, it's more like our seminars, just we don't have the live audience, we had the virtual audience, and hey, I think it probably worked just as good. We still got to talk to the people, so we got to interact with them. Uh, I do like the live ones when it's in person. There's something just different. It's yeah. like, listen, you can listen to a song on the radio. It sounds great. It's your favorite song. It's just still cooler when you do it in person. Oh, yeah. Always. When you go to a concert. So uh, when we do the seminars in person, I like those a lot better. And I think the next one of those we're going to do is actually going to be three weeks from now, not two weeks from now. It'll be at our One Tribe Foundation 22 Kill Benefit Tournament, Friday registration. We'll kick that off first thing with a seminar. We'll have a concert immediately following that seminar. That whole night of registration for that tournament is a little bit of fun. Yeah. It's, it's a party, man. It's a good, like we cut up, we have a blast at that registration seminar and concert that we do Friday night, July 1st this year. July 2nd will be a team tournament, open team tournament. July 3rd will be our uh, guide slash your Lake Fort Guide Celebrity Tournament. Uh, we're going to have a good time that weekend. And it's for a good cause. It's for a really important important cause, which we've talked about a lot lately. Uh, but every dollar that we raise, the open team tournament to 70% payback, 30% goes to the foundation. Every dollar raised in the auction goes straight to the foundation. Every, autumn raised in, every dollar raised in the guide celebrity tournament goes straight to the foundation. This deal is all about raising money for that foundation. And they benefit they benefit veterans and first responders so uh, it is a great organization you'll hear more about it you've already heard more about it in other videos we've done you'll hear more about it leading up to this event um, it's just a great 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 event you can go ahead and actually register now <laughs> you can get pre-registered at uh, www.fishlife.net we have a registration link on that website so so what are you gonna do this year if somebody challenges you to a push-up challenge again I'm gonna win just like I did last year <laughs> who won I don't remember. Who won the push-up challenge? I think that Army guy did. Boy, you have lost <laughs> your mind. Listen, we so here's how that unfolded. I didn't really, I wasn't really like, it was loud. There was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of chaos, that that deal. And this was at the very end of the registration party, right, after the concert. Somehow they're like, let's do 22 push-ups for 22 kill or whatever. Because that's how their whole foundation started was they did 22 push-ups for, because 22 veterans a day were committing suicide. So, I just heard push-ups. I didn't know we were doing 22. 
like just for 22 kill, and it was me and an army guy and an air force guy. Leave it to the air force guy to be the smart one in the group. So we rip out 22. And I'm like yelling and stuff while I'm pushing up, like doing Marine Corps cow offs and just yelling crazy stuff. And I ain't done a push up in years, bro. Like in years. <laughs> I don't exercise. I don't ever exercise at all. Anybody that knows me knows I don't. So I'm just ripping these push offs off on pure adrenaline alone. My fat butt. It's hard to push 260 off the ground, Cody. I'm going to tell you. So we get to 22. The Air Force guy gets up. I'm like, dang. And he was the most in shape guy out of the three of us. He gets up. I'm like, man. Soft Air Force guy, he quit early. No, he just did what he was supposed to do. <laughs> so me and the Army guy, Jacob Bell, are sitting there just going at it. And we just keep going, just keep going, keep going. And I kind of, he stops. And so I stop. And I'm like, you got a couple to catch up with. You better keep going, Army dog. And he does a couple, and then we keep going. And then we finally get to a point where we're both starting to slow down. And I look at him, I go, are you tired? He goes, yeah, I'm tired. I go, okay, one more. We did one more. I go, all right, that's good. I waited till he got up. As soon as he got up, I did one more. And it was like slow motion because I was struggling. I did one more just to say I won. So I want to tell you something. I just had Jacob Bell in my boat. Yeah, I know. And I want to tell you, uh, I think the man's been hitting the gym. He called me the other day and told me that he's been practicing because he wants to beat me in a push-up contest. Yeah, I think he's – man, I'm just going to say it. I better start ripping some push-ups you, out. You should. So counted it up in the video. There was video of this. Counted it up in the video. I did 47 consecutive push-ups without stopping. And I'm a fat guy that weighs 260 and never works out. Like, I'll be honest with you, I was really proud of that. 47 push-ups in a row, like, that's great for me. Yeah, that's probably more than I can do right now. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. It was pure adrenaline, bro. Pure adrenaline is all it was. Because I guarantee you, I couldn't do 15 right now. No. Like, ain't no way. <laughs> ain't no way, man. Especially after that great meal that Lainey cooked us. Yeah, the princess made dinner for us tonight. You had dinner up. We had dinner up before we came on. Did this? She uh, she did some Italian sausage stuff with cheese and some sauce. It was good. Man, it was good. It was uh, good. But I do want to add one more thing uh, that I forgot to earlier. Uh, for all you people that you know have maybe never fished one of these tournaments before, um, or you're new to Texas laws, you need to make sure that you can pass a boat inspection. Because you don't want to bring yeah. in a huge fish and get disqualified because you don't have it right. Yeah. You got to have a life jacket for everybody in your boat. That's right. got to have a throw cushion. Yep. got to have a whistle or a horn or something. Whistle, horn, yeah, or, or air horn. A fire extinguisher that is good. Yep. Not expired. Yep. Uh, your kill switch has to work. Kill switch has to work. Yep. Um, no alcohol in the boat. No alcohol in the boat. You got to wear your life jacket when your big motor's turned on. That's right. That's right. Anything else? Uh, so there is a new law. I don't know how that's going to go into effect. But if you have the self-inflatable life jackets, if that's all you have in the boat, you have to have them on all day long. What? Yes. One of my buddies got pulled Even over. Even while you're fishing? Yes. One of my buddies got pulled over. The game warden told him about this. If you don't have a regular life jacket in the boat, you have to wear that self-inflatable one at all times. How about that? Yeah, I, didn't I that. didn't know that either. Also, now in Texas, since a couple years ago, your kill switch must, which in tournaments this has always been the rule, but your kill switch must be attached to you when the big motor's in operation in the state of Texas, yeah. period. Whether you're wearing a life jacket or not, because it's not a law to wear a life jacket in the state of Texas no. uh, for adults, but you do have to have your kill switch attached to you while your big motor's in operation. Yep. Yeah. So just make sure all those things, go through a pre-check in the morning, uh, or tonight, that way you can go to the store and get what you need. But just make sure. I, I'd hate for somebody to get disqualified because of that. So. When are you starting the night trips, Cody? Uh, you say when. I've already booked a couple up uh, in June and July, but um, I don't know who that is. But just get with me if you want to go, and we'll we'll get a date. That's Calvin. Oh, Calvin. That's okay. Calvin. That's Calvin. Oh, big C. He knows how to holler at you. Oh, yeah. All right, man. Thank you guys so much for joining us at this week's bi-weekly seminar, not from Lake Ford Marina. We avoided the crowd at the Skeeter uh, owner's registration. But, uh, Cody, shake your hand one more time, dude. Yes, thank, thank you for all the help tonight. Thank you guys, most importantly of all, for watching us. We do want to give Lake Ford Marina a shout-out. They are a great partner to us, uh, allowing us to use their facility the way they do. We've got the Your Lake Ford Guy Pro Lanes out. They're, the only place you can buy them in person at the store is Lake Fork Marina. You can also buy them at yourlakeforkguy.com. We have those lanes available for all Lowrance Graphs as well as all Hummingbird, Helix, Solix, and even older generations of Hummingbirds as well. So thank you guys, as always, for watching it, and we will see you next time right here. Where are we going to see them, Cody?
on your life for good. That's right.